guest is the defensive coordinator of MSU Mankato, Jim Glogowski. Coach, introduce yourself to our audience. Yeah, Jim Glogowski, uh, currently the uh, defensive coordinator. I coach the linebackers here at MSU and uh, been here five years, but only coached four. So looking forward to year six and hopefully a fifth season coming up. So, Coach, I understand that you have some too high stuff that you're going to talk about uh, and the way that the MSU Maverick defense works. I mean, we know just based off of, you know, following upper Midwest football that you guys have been one of the best nation or best uh, defenses in the nation, not to mention the upper Midwest. So we're really excited to learn about how your defense structures, their run fits and, and just everything that you're willing to share with us. We can't wait to find it out. Yeah, for sure. It's a pleasure to be on with you guys. I've uh, been following you guys for a while. And I tell you what, with the, with the pandemic and all that stuff going on, I've had a chance to be online with some the Texas coaches and their chalkboard wars and, and following different guys and sitting in on different talks. And of course, right now we're in the middle of the AFCA National Coaches Convention, right, for all levels of coaches, and that's virtual. So I will say this, there's, there's a ton of resources out there. Um, certainly don't pretend to have all the answers. I got to give a lot of credit to the guys that came before me here. Just the most recent past, uh, Joe Klanderman ran this defensive structure. And I think most of you guys know he's now the defensive coordinator at Kansas State. Then that was followed by Jake Dickert. Jake did a great job, moved on to South Dakota State, Wyoming, and now he's the defensive coordinator at Washington State. And so um, certainly those guys kind of created the identity of the defense. And, you know, I think hopefully, hopefully when people think about us, they think about our offensive line and how we like to run the football. And then I'd like to think that playing good defense is right there. And, um, you know, we got – I can share this with you here at my screen and kind of get into this a little bit with you guys. And, you know, the biggest thing I think when, when we talk about our defense – uh, is, is kind of creating a mentality, you know, if that makes sense. And that's something, you know, the older I've gotten and, and the more that I've, um, you know, kind of looked at what we do. Uh, hopefully you guys can see that with the shark up there. Mm -hmm. All right. So the first thing, you know, and I'll just kind of go through a couple of preliminary things before we get into the nuts and bolts of it. But I think it's really important to create an identity and have your kids buy into it. And <laughs> ours is spins up. It's a shark mentality. And it's, you know, uh, Joe Rossi, actually, I actually coached Joe Rossi up. Uh, he's the defensive coordinator at the University of Minnesota. Years ago, I coached him. And and Joe, I, I listen to him talk, and I see on Twitter, they talk about the Megalodon, I think, and the big shark. They, that's kind of their thing a little bit. So hopefully there's no copyright infringement. I certainly didn't steal this from the Gophers, but um, <laughs> neither one of us probably have rights to a fish like that since he's a gopher and I'm a bovine. But anyways, long story <laughs> short, um, we were about three or four years ago and, and kind of struggled through fall camp, and it was a Monday, and the guys were complaining. and. And we talked about being motivated and what makes motivation. And I just, out of, you know, kids today, I just Googled Monday motivation. And this screen pops up of a shark. And it talked about a shark, about how, you know, sharks don't care about Mondays. You know, they get up, they're swimming around, they're scary, they bite stuff, they, they're a shark. And, and that was kind of our thing. And then it kind of devolved into this thing of like, okay, if that's what a shark is, let's, let's talk more about it. And for us, a shark is about, you know, they have eyes in front. They don't, you know, sharks don't swim backwards. You know, they have a killer instinct. And the reason why sharks are so scary is because sharks are in the water where they're comfortable and we're not as humans, right? And you have no idea how deep it is and all this kind of other stuff. And so it became kind of our mantra as a defense about how can we create this mentality so when people come to the Blake, that's our aquarium, if you will. And we know the surroundings. And I can't tell you, playoff team after playoff team that's had to come up here in December. And maybe some of you guys remember a couple of years ago, we played in a blizzard versus a team out of Texas. And you know, the running joke, not so funny as a defensive guy, but last year when we got beat in the national championship game, we, we drew the short straw because we got West Florida and their spread offense and their speed on a 50-degree night with turf down in Texas. You know, that wasn't, that wasn't a great matchup. And Coach Hoffner, our head coach, always says, man, if we would have got West Florida on our, in the Blake in December, we would have beat it by 50, right? They would have the snow <laughs> and all that. So, so we kind of try to play up to that a little bit, and, that, and that's kind of our deal. And with, with that being said, we talk about just – I don't want to cut to the chase because I know we don't have a ton of time. And I, I do talk fast. So I apologize, but I get excited. And we're talking about how do we measure production? And so everything we do here, and I know there's a lot of great programs out there. Uh, matter of fact, I heard Matt Ince from North Dakota State talk about like goal boards, right? How you keep track of tackles and TFLs and all that. And I think those are awesome things. And for me, I've been a, you know, a guy who was coached at the Division II and Division Three levels. So resources and all those kind of things have been a challenge. So for us, we try to keep it simple. And, and this is what we believe in at Minnesota State, right? How are we going to measure production? So when our kids walk in on Sunday, we talk about these things specifically. Number one, on first down, it's four yards or less, right? That's the goal. On second down, it's less than half the remaining yardage. So if it's second and eight and we give up three or four, that's a plus. 
And nowadays with Huddle, if you guys have Huddle, you know there's a column on there that says efficiency, right? Efficient. So it's pretty simple. So when I have a guy breaking down film, it's either yes or no, were we efficient or not? And that's how we kind of measure. It's a real, I mean, it's a poor man's way of doing it, but it's a real basic generic way to find out if we were an efficient team or not. We want to be efficient 85% of the time if we can. And so we get to third down, right? So if it's third and two and we give up one, we were efficient. If it's fourth and 12 and we give up 10, we were efficient, right? That's all we care about is winning the down. And then ultimately fourth down, right? Don't let them convert. Third down is 65%. So this is how we measure success for a defense. And, and all the other stuff aside, yeah, winning games and all that stuff. But, man, if you can't believe in the process now after Nick Saban and watching that, I don't know what you're watching. Because to me, whatever you want to call it, the process, the grind, you know, whatever, it's about doing the little things right over and over again and not getting bored by it. And, you know, we always say don't get bored by the mundane, the over and over. And it gets most people beat because they won't pay attention to detail, you know, for 60 minutes or 75 snaps or whatever you got to take. Uh, with that being said, these are our goals, okay? So goal board aside, on Sunday we come in, it's points. Did they score 19 or less? And interestingly, those notes right there, you'll see, I did a study and looked at the last nine years of our league, the Northern Sun Conference, and on average, the best defense in our league, North and South Division, there's some great defenses. Duluth does a great job. The Gang Green defense up at Bemidji does a great job. But on average, the best defenses in our league gave up 13.7 points per game. OK, number two is stop the run. We want to hold people under 100 yards per game, period. But again, if you look back over the last several years in the Northern Sun, the best defense in our league has given up 75 yards per game or less. Right. And takeaways. We don't say turnovers because I don't expect the offense, you know, to just turn the ball over to us and give it to us. We want to try to physically take it away. And like most people, practice taking the ball away. We want three per game. Obviously, you'll play 11 games. That's 33 a season. But this is a phenomenal stat, right? So the last nine years, on average, the best defenses in the league averaged 31 takeaways. That's incredible, right? That's two to three per game. That's in, that's in, obviously you're going to win a lot of games doing that. I think I heard on Monday night in Alabama, there's something like 10 of the games or something like they turn it over one or less times. Well, you're going to win a lot of football games so you don't give people the easy ones, right? And if they don't turn it over on Monday, I don't know if Ohio State's even in the game. That early fumble, right? So anyways, get away from that. And the fourth thing is third down. We are huge on third down. The money down, make a big deal about it. We want 67% success rate. And obviously you can see in our league, the best defense is on average. If you're the best defense in the league, on average, you're about 72%. That means 72% of the time you're getting off the field on third down, right? Pretty understandable, pretty simple. Um, and then the foundation of our defense, three things. Don't make, it, don't make it difficult. Pursue the football, tackle the ball, take it away. Pretty cut and dry there. OK, and then we have we kind of talk about this a lot. If you hear me yelling out low, flow, flow, that's just a flat out lack of fundamental effort. And, and I'll tell you what, I'm a state school guy. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm not very smart. I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer. I don't pretend to be. I'm not going to outsmart you. I'm not going to overanalyze it. I want our kids to play incredibly hard. I want our kids to play with such passion. And they're only going to do that if they understand what they're doing. So we talk about loafing. Don't loaf. Loafing is a lack of a fundamental effort. Right? You don't sprint to the ball. You turn, you're turn. you not turning and running when the ball is pitched, right? Or tossed. Uh, not finishing aggressively. You got to finish it. I want you to run through that dude's front side, come out the backside mentality. I want that guy doing it right, eyes up, right? See what you hit, all that good stuff. But I want you to be so aggressive, do it clean, but play as hard as you can. Do not stay on the ground, right? We talk about hot stove. Just like if you're a little kid, you put your hand on the stove. First thing you do is you pop your hand off that stove. That's what should happen if you get blocked. Get up off the ground and go. And then last, this is like my biggest pet beef. Guys are classic. They think the guy's tackled. They slow up. And then all of a sudden, they start pumping their arms and taking off because they realize the guy missed the tackle. So those five things we are insanely critical about. We grade two things. We grade every single competitive rep in practice. Coach Hoffner, our head coach, he wants to see a grade every competitive rep. So every seven on seven, every inside run drill, every you know, scrimmage period, whatever, we're grading that in practice. And then, of course, we grade our, our Sunday, uh, we grade our game film. The only two things we grade are effort, plus or minus, and we grade results. Was it positive or negative? Did you do the right thing, right? And that's it. We Two things. Keep it clear because our kids, I don't know about you guys, but our kids, their attention span is crazy. You got to give it to them in short, quick bursts so they understand it. If I give them a whole page of breakdown and all these notes – Hell, half the time our scouting reports don't get opened. I probably shouldn't say that. You're not going to publish that. You can cut that part out. But, I mean, <laughs> half the time, I mean, your kids don't look at 35 pages of scouting reports, right? Usually we do all that stuff, so we feel like we're prepared, which is fine. 
I've got a call sheet. I don't even hardly look at the call sheet. You know, it's like taking a test. You don't get a call sheet when you go get to take a test. You got to know the information. So I challenge our kids to know the information as well. Okay. Uh, with that being said, just some of the basics. Okay. And, and this is, I'm just going to start in the front and try to give you as much as possible, but we are, I call it crushing the front. All right. And this is kind of our MO. This is what we do. Our whole objective. Okay. Is to get the ball to bounce. I want the ball running left and right. I don't want it going north and south. End of story. We take a lot of pride that when we get off the bus on Saturday afternoon and we go play somebody, that our kids are they're, they're tuned into the game plan, they know what to look at, and they react a certain way. Whatever happens after that, I can't control it, right, for the most part. There's no blow the whistle, bingo, do it over. The idea is to get lined up and make it simple. So we kind of gave this idea about crushing the front, and there's no secret sauces. I actually got this from – a couple of years ago, we uh, we came off a tough season in 2016, and we were going to open up with the triple option. So I called up Rich Wright, the head coach down at Northwest Missouri State, and they had just got done playing Harding University in the playoffs the year before and absolutely whitewashed Harding in the playoffs, like averaging 350 a game on the ground with the triple, and they held them to 75 yards, like something like that crazy in the playoff game and beat them. So I'm like, okay, I like what you're doing. And so he was starting to talk about this concept of, you know, if you can imagine – teaching your D-line, but never using pop-up pass rush dummies, right? This idea of just teaching it very simple, basic, make the ball bounce. Similar to what you do versus the triple team, right? You play a tight five, you squeeze the B-gap, hands on guys, don't let them to the second level. Not necessarily your classic just hold guys up and let the backers run free. It wasn't that. It was this concept of pace. And this is something I talk about our guys have to understand. Do we understand the pace that you need to take as a defensive lineman in order to get to your gap? Let me give you an example. If we're running a stunt, the DN crashes right now, that's a pretty quick pace, right? Makes sense. If I'm going to tell you we're playing triple and your five technique needs to get hands on the tackle, he rides the tackle, right? Hands on, and he slowly gets to the B gap or he works his way to B gap. There's a big difference in the pace. So we kind of took the middle of that, the mean. We took right in the middle. We said, okay, we're not going to spike the gap. We're not going to sit there and hold the defensive end on the tackle, but we're going to work through the guy into the next gap. So we assign the gap, but how we get there and the pace of how we get there was something we tried to manipulate, if that makes sense, okay? So moving forward, what were the strengths? Well, obviously the strengths, we, we, bid, we based it out of a too high shell, all right? And, and my belief is, you know, you got two thought process. You want to close the middle or you want to open the middle up, right? If you want to have an open field, you can have two high safeties. But if you're going to take away the middle of the field, you put a post safety back there, then obviously you're going to have either cover three or in an eight-man box, or you got a two high shell. And in my opinion, you have a nine-man box. So I figure nine's better than eight. Like I said, not very smart, but that makes sense to me. And so we want to be able to have an extra hat to either side of the ball. Now, of course, those are really positives, extra hats in the box. Assignment football, you have to understand, you know, what you have versus what gap. And, you know, it's really good versus quarterback run game because you can assign guys to players. And it's not, well, if this happens, you have this, and that happens, you have that. No, it's if it runs this way, you're quarterback. If it runs that way, you're cutback. It's pretty cut and dry. There is no ifs, ands, or buts, okay? Matchup pass responsibilities. If you're going to have a too high safety shell, then you have to have the ability to pass off routes and play more of a matchup zone, right, versus spot dropping if that makes sense, where you tell the curl player to run out to 10 yards deep and two yards outside the hash and all that, okay? And the last thing is, I believe it's flexible enough to play against anything. Back when I first started coaching, the big thing was, well, a three. I, I first really got my first full-time job out in Pennsylvania with the Steelers and Dick LeBeau. You guys probably remember that guy. He was kind of like the grandfather of the zone blitz. He used to always talk about being a 3-4 front because you can disguise who the blitzers are. And when you play a four-down front, they know who's coming, right? That was kind of my whole initial introduction to 3-4 and 4-3. Well, my thing is, listen, man, you might know who's coming, but and I know who's coming. Let's see who out executes who versus trying to beat you on the guess, if that makes sense. And so that's kind of been my philosophy all along. So if those are the strengths, here's the weaknesses. If you're going to play a high safety fit, a, a, a too high safety fit, you are not going to have a lot of post help. And you got to decide what you're going to give up. And the way we play our traditional quarters is we are going to defend the post ball to the nth degree. We're going to disguise, do whatever, but we are not going to give up a post for a touchdown. Now, you know, you guys are all smart guys, so if you're taking away the post, you're probably going to give out the outside corner route. And my thought is, like a lot of people think, that's the most difficult, longest throw. Let them take their shots. They're going to catch a couple. You can't have a head guy who's going to freak out when they catch a corner route for 28 yards, right? Or, you know, not that mine does or doesn't. It's a disclaimer. But the point is, is that you have to understand what you're giving up. 
So here's this is a really kind of important thing. And I try to tell our players this. When they come to the sideline and we give up a corner out and we're in quarters, we can probably fix it. But the reality of it is if he throws it and they catch it, they're pretty good. They can, they can do that too. They have scholarships they practice. We played West Florida the national championship game. My man was straight fire in the first half. At halftime, I just said to the guys, well, you know, we can keep on going and give up 80, and people probably turn the game off anyway, so that's probably a good thing. They're not watching anyways. Or we can keep doing what we're doing and do it better because there's no magical call. But if that kid, if you watch the film back in that game, that was the one game we lost, he was pinpoint dropping balls in. We, we were right there a couple times. Sometimes they had a great day. So we have to understand that. The quick passing game is a problem, obviously, if you're going to play too high shell. So things like hitches, right? You're going to have to rally to it. You're not going to stop a hitch. Things like that. You want to play cover two, you can stop the hitch, but you're going to give up something else. So, right, it's give and take. And then ultimately, you have to communicate extremely well so you understand the fit. And this is where I'll get into our count. And we, had, we create this count system so we can develop a process for our guys to figure out not what gap they have, but what up angle they take to tackle the football. All right, so here's the basic elements of it, okay? It's pretty simple. First of all, the idea of crushing the front, we're going to eliminate the A's and B's, right? Somehow, some way, make the ball bounce. Some people decide to line move. Some people stick the two DNs into B on the snap, twist, stunts, whatever. It's been done a thousand different ways over the years. The other thing that's really important for us is the count system. What I want our kids to understand is we want to know how many available blockers are in the box. That's what we want to know, Okay. And then once we determine how many guys are in the, the box to block, we want one more. That's the whole thing. Okay, now follow me here. Once they realize that, like, for example, let's say they have eight guys to block. We got to have nine. Now, who are those nine guys? And once you know who those nine guys are, now we sign. Basically, I, it's like a roadmap. Once you know who, if you're, once you know that you're driving, I'm going to tell you, here's your map to get there. That's kind of how it is. Okay, if that makes sense. I'm big in analogies. Sometimes they make sense. Sometimes it completely misses. So stop me if I'm talking too fast or it's not making sense. So here's how we determine the count, all right? The offensive line plus the tight ends in the box plus the running back is the number of offensive count. Makes sense, right? We never count the quarterback. And the reason why we never count the quarterback is is because in days gone by, you could always assume the quarterback was going to hand the ball off. Well, as you guys know, back in the day, unless you were playing a triple team, the quarterback was not a non-factor. And as, and as we've evolved offensively, now the quarterbacks become a threat. So we assume the quarterback is always going to carry the ball. Always. So this whole thing about a quarterback and plus one run schemes, we assume anybody, because anybody can. You know, we had some really good football players at quarterback, but I wouldn't say they were Lamar Jackson, but those guys could still run quarterback power pretty well because it's a design run play with a quarterback, right? And if you're willing to run the quarterback, it doesn't. you don't have to have Lamar Jackson back there to run quarterback run game, right? So we assume the quarterback is going to carry the football. So we never count him, right? So that way we're not short a hat. At the worst, we'll be even, okay? Where people become short in the box is because they don't account for all of the gaps and all the ball carriers. That's why quarterback run game is so deadly because they're usually either even hats or you've got one more blocker than you got hats in the box. And that's why I think John asked that question at the beginning. That's why people are a little antsy about stopping the run with two high safeties because you're not rolling down a predetermined defender. You have to kind of guess on the run, if that makes sense. What we try to do with the count, if this makes sense, is we eliminate the guesswork. We know pre-snap who the extra fitter is and who isn't. There is no reading it on the run, if that makes sense. Okay? Moving forward, then, once we find out what the offensive count is, then we've got to determine the defensive count. Well, if you're saying that the four guys, and this word crush, not to be mistaken, it's not like, a, you know, everyone's just bashing inside to stop the run. It's not like that. It's not like a goal line pinch. That's not the idea. I had a guy I was talking to last year, and he's like, so I, you guys, I understand you just pinch the front. Oh, that's like nails on a chalkboard. No, we don't pinch the front. It's not pinching the front. We want to work to the gap, okay? So with that being said, what we want to do is we want to say, all right, we're going to have a defensive count. If you've got eight blockers, we got to have nine defenders. The assumption is always made that the first four guys in the defensive count are, of course, your defensive linemen. That's assumed. They're always the four guys, right? First four. Okay, well, once I take four off the top, what's left over? Five. Now we got to determine who those five guys are. And again, the goal is to have one more defender in the count than the offense can. Now, as you can probably imagine, the big, you know, the big elephant in the room here is if you're going to do that and have one more guy in the box, you're probably going to find yourselves in a lot of one-on-one -on -one matchups on the perimeter. And that is true. But to me, going back to our philosophy, we want to stop the run. 
I never said anything in those first four things that we tried to do about passing yards. We gave up, my God, uh, probably a world record for passing yards in the national championship game, yet we still had a chance to win the football game 48 to 40 because at the end of the day, you got to run the ball to win. I think we held West Florida something like five or 10 yards rushing and 5,000 passing. But because of that, we still had a chance at the end of the game when you got to kill the clock, you can't kill the clock throwing it. I don't care what anybody says. You can certainly have short pass game and all that. But as soon as you start going deep, when guys roll up, now you kill the clock and now you allow teams back in the game. So I think we all agree you got to run the football at some point to win football games. All right. Everything okay? Going too fast? No, you're right. No, this is awesome. This is a wealth of knowledge, coach. We're just soaking it in. <laughs> Okay, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to explain to you how we count it on a basic front. Now, I would love to show you guys the most simplest formation, which I think we all could agree would be iPro. Unfortunately, if I ask you guys to guess, how many times do you think we saw straight iPro last year? Less than 10%. Less than, less than 10 snaps out of 1,000, believe it. We, this is about as close as I could find to iPro. This is Sioux Falls. They're in a straight pro formation, if you will. And they've got two backs in the backfield. Although, of course, like us, Sioux Falls does a great job with their run game. They've got a fullback. Is it actually a tight end? So body type-wise, it's 12 personnel, right? So you know you got some mobility there. That's the challenge. But let's just talk about the numbers and the count. So as you look at us get lined up, there, of course, you can see the front four guys. There's your four guys in the count, right? But let's just start with the offense first. You got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight guys, right? There's your eight. You don't count the quarterback. He doesn't count. So you've got eight guys in the count. If we're going to have one more than them, obviously, we've got to have nine, right? Okay, so here's four right off the bat. There's four defensive linemen, right? So subtract those four right away, and there's five left over. So now we got to determine who the five guys are. Well, pretty simple. If you're a quarters team and somebody puts two slot receivers out there, and you're a quarters team, let's just talk straight vanilla here. If you're a quarters team, that usually means you have four guys deep, right? That's quarters in a, in a very magical vanilla world. So that means the corner and the safety cannot be in the run fit because they're playing their quarter, right? So if you have two speed receivers, or, and I call anybody out here, anybody out in the slot, I call him a speed. I don't care if it's a tight end. I don't care if it's a left tackle. If they put two receivers out in the, out in the slot, away, broken from the formation, I call that two speed. Okay, it's not an indication about the ability. It's an indication of the position. Two guys out in the slot, that's speed. So anytime we get two speed right off the bat, those safeties are out of the fit. If we do not have two speed, then somehow, some way, the safety's in the fit. End of story. End of story. So I'm going to use a real simple example here. Okay, let's go to the type. In this particular situation, you can see right off the bat, there's your pro formation. Now, the one thing about us that's extremely unique is we are an insert quarters team, all right? And so when I say insert quarters, I'll go back to the wide. That means that our quarters coverage allow the two safeties. Now, keep in mind, they're not pulled out of the box because there's not a slot receiver, right? There's a one receiver. So the safety is actually going to insert inside the outside linebackers. This is our – we just call it what you want. We call this guy Will. We call this guy Nickel. Nickel is the strong side outside linebacker. The Will is the weak side outside linebacker. And the Mike, I know this is earth shattering. He's the middle backer, right? <laughs> and then we have a pretty complicated, this guy, go figure. He's the field safety, and he's the boundary safety. So in a perfect world, who are those guys? Well, our field safety is your traditional middle third, cover three, center fielder, right? Our boundary safety is your traditional strong safety. That's really where it stops and starts. Our will is the weak side backer that if I had my druthers, he would never be locked up on the slot, but he's an outside backer who can play in space. And my nickel is basically your really athletic strong safety who could cover number two if need be. That's how we design it. Now, our corners, for the most part, we're playing off technique, right? We're playing what we call read technique, which means they're reading through the three-step of the quarterback. So if they get three-step, they're breaking on one right now. If they get clear, if the quarterback clears the three-step drop, then they get their eyes back to one and basically pedal and play a traditional off-man technique. But we call that a read technique. Anytime that you're reading something else before you do your secondary duty, that's a read technique. So for example... The field safety right here. Does he have a vertical threat? Because in quarters, as you guys are probably familiar with, if I just go to the tight real quick, in quarters, the safety is responsible for the vertical of two, right? That's a pretty traditional vertical of two. And then the outside backer takes the first guy in the flat, right? That's usually how it works. And then this safety would have the first vertical of two, and then the outside backer is the first guy in the flat. 
So those are universal rules in quarters. That doesn't change for anything. Our corners then are basically off man. So if the, if the receiver drags under right away, he'll let him go. If he does anything else, he'll cover him. Not too complicated. It's just like anybody else playing off man. But you have to play that technique because the safeties are in the run fit. Now, if you're going to play inside off man at one by seven, you're probably going to give up the speed out. You're probably going to give up hitches and comebacks, right? And I understand that. But here's the thing I would tell you. Don't ever hang your hat. Don't ever hang your hat on saying it's third and two. They're going to run out or a quick hitch or something like that. I need to play read, and then I need to tell that guy to press him. We don't do that. I never bleed concepts and coverages. So in other words, if I really think he's going to throw the ball into the boundary on a hitch, I will call a different coverage to stop that. I'm not going to take the coverage that we play every single day and start to manipulate it and morph it and have the kid come off the sideline and say, hey, this series in our read coverage, go ahead and press bail. I don't do that because I don't want to bleed coverages. We have about four or five main coverages that we just change in and out. And if I give up a hitch and we're in quarters, so what? Tackle it. Then we spend most of our time on how to approach the catch and how to tackle it. I don't try to stop the call because it wasn't ideal and we can manipulate it and, and, and fidget and fudge it a little bit to get the right result. Does that, does that make sense? I think that's a mistake a lot of people make, and I made it too, is you say, this is my base, and I'm just going to kind of just kind of morph it and shape it a little bit to fit this particular Friday night. The next thing you know, the kid says on Tuesday of next week, hey, are we, are we still playing it like last week or are we going to do it like we're doing it normally? And the kid's confused. I don't want confusion. So with that being said, because we insert the quarters, safeties, the outside linebackers are what we call lever players. Now, lever does not mean contain. The outside backer, the nickel and the wheel, they're going to lever, get to the line of scrimmage, make the running back, make a decision. So let's just say, for example, they just ran zone this way. My, my priority for that outside backer would be get to the line of scrimmage, Make sure the receiver cannot dig him out, right? And he's going to hold the line of scrimmage and make that running back either bounce outside or cut back inside. What he can't do is run up the field and let that running back stick his left foot in the ground and be gone down the diagonal alley. Cannot allow that. I don't care if our outside backers let the running back bounce to the perimeter. That's fine. We'll run it down. And nine times out of ten, he'll go to the sideline and he'll do it once. He'll try to do it again, and the coach will be yelling at him on the sideline on offense because he keeps sticking and bouncing, and he won't pour it up in there. How many times have you heard that, right? Pour it up in there, man. You know, that's what he says. And the guy's kid's like, oh, well, I could have bounced it. And he bounces it once, and then he does it again, and it's on third and two. He loses six yards because he should have poured it up in there. So we're creating indecision on their part, if that makes sense. Now, our Mike backer is our Mike backer. We have the simplest rules in America, I swear to God, how to line up the Mike backer. You always shade inside the third threat. Simple as that. There's no A gap, 10, 20, 30, because it doesn't matter. You're crushed from the front. It doesn't matter. As far as the Mike's concerned, he's a scrape to spill guy either way. End of story. Simple, because you got these guys technically responsible for A, B, A, B. Those guys have A, B, and A, B. So if that's what they're responsible for, the Mike is a scrape to spill. Now, does that mean that sometimes this three technique here might get stuck in B gap and the Mike might have to play it? Yeah, for sure. But we don't say he has a gap. We just say scrape and spill behind the ball and make it all bounce. It's as simple as it gets. So if you count from outside in, who's the third guy? Well, the receiver's one, the tight end's two, fullback's three. So 55 is going to line up inside shade of the fullback. If that fullback walks over here and lines up right here, right, if he lines up right here, who's three? Well, then it's the tailback. So 55 is inside shade of the tailback, inside foot on the tailback. It's just simple. And then he just – literally, there's times I tell 55 to pop your feet and don't move. And most people would freak out if their Mike Backer wasn't taking his read steps. But I just want those guys to be patient. He's not – you have to get away – this is how I look at it. We have to get away from our players thinking that they're responsible to tackle the football. They're not. 55 is no different than taking your thumb and forefinger at the bottom of your tube of toothpaste and pushing it from the bottom up when it's almost out. I want it all out of the tube. That's what 55 does, if that makes sense. He starts at the bottom of the tube and pushes it out the top. Don't run to the middle of the tube like my wife does in the first brand new tube of tube. She squeezes it right in the middle. I hate that. And you got some at the bottom and some at the top. I don't want my mic backer to, to run over here, right, and, and try to make the tackle. I want him to push everything inside out. And you know what, 55? If the ball comes to you, tackle it, do your job. If it doesn't, who cares? You're not getting brownie points or more scholarship money if you're the team leader in tackles. That's not how it works, Okay. So with that being said, we got the outside backers. They're the, they're the lever players. We got him as a scrape to spill guy. And then these guys are critical. It's pretty simple. If they have a vertical threat, which obviously number this guy over here does, right? The tight end can go vertical, then he's playing a read technique. So again, go back to the idea of what red 
read technique meant for the corners. It meant you read a certain thing and then you play your technique. Read means the same thing for the safety, except in his case, he's going to read the tight end. If he goes vertical, he covers him. If he goes out or under, he lets him go and he plays inside out. Simple as that. If it's run, he is the second fitter because he, if you go back to the Y, actually, I'll give you the next play here. It's a better example. Okay. So this is pro, right? So right now, same thing. He's the widest guy over here. He's the safety. So if the ball would, let's say, if they just ran outside zone with the quarterback, you know, student body, right? If they did that, he would lever it. He's the next guy in the fit. Then it would be the backer. Then in this case, it'd be that backer. Then eventually be the safety. Okay. And so if you look at this from a tight angle, if we just look at that, okay, and we count from outside in, who's the widest defender? It's him. So he's the first guy in the fit. Well, who's the next defender from left to right? It's him. So he's right there. Who's the next defender? It's him, and then it's him, and then it's him. Now, we've simply just fifth. We just – because they're an offset and because of the formation, we just told the safety and the linebacker to just switch. We switched the fit. So instead of it, typically the linebacker, the will being out here and the safety being there, we do have the ability because of, in, for all intents and purposes, Upper Iowa has overloaded it to the field here, right? The back's offset, the fullback. Everybody's over there, and they weren't a counter team. He were probably going to run quarterback sweep. So because of that, we might as well say, well, it makes more sense to get our backer who's used to scraping in space closer to the football than our safety. But it doesn't change as far as the order of fit. It's all about how they're numbered from left to right. So if I go back to the very beginning of our talk and we talked about counting the offensive numbers, you've got five linemen and a tight end. That's six. Two running backs make seven, eight. So there's eight guys in the offensive count. Got to have one more on defense. So who are our nine? Well, the four guys here, that's four. And then here's your five. That makes nine. And our kids know. We, here's what we do. It's like flashcards. I hold up pro, and they guess the number in the offensive count. So I hold up pro, and they automatically say eight. I hold up slot, open, right, with no tight end, and they say seven. They know right away the formation clicks with the numbers. There's not that many of them, right? It's like math facts. Five times five is 25, right? So that's how we teach it. And then ultimately – once they get lined up and they know there has to be nine guys in the fit, nine guys always means both safeties, right? Because both corners are playing, the, the, so they know. And then, then it's just a matter of looking to your left, looking to your right, and seeing where I'm at. You never – this is the key caveat. You never stand on top of color. So I could never have a safety lined right over the top of this guy because that will confuse us. Then we won't know who the next fitter is, okay? And then with that being said, the, the cherry on top of this whole thing is – then we assign, like I told you guys, we assign a roadmap. We give them a course of action to take once they know what number they are in the fit, right? So number one, the first guy is always, and I said it earlier, you probably know it. What do you think we call this first guy's technique? It starts with an L. Lever. Lever. He's the lever guy. So lever guy sets the lever. He sets the edge, right? That's what he does. He's the first guy in the fit. And I teach the lever. We spend so much time on the actual technique. Inside foot up, outside foot back. Do not bring your right arm in. Ride it like a cowboy. Left foot, left leg. Keep your outside arm and leg free. Do not bring your outside arm in. Because once you bring your outside arm in, you close your shoulders, and now it's damn near impossible if he stick and bounces for you to get lateral and push back outside. That's why it's okay for the kid to bounce because your position allows you to stick your inside foot in the ground and flatten, turn, and run outside to ch chase him. If you bring your outside body in, and you turn your shoulders, and you're essentially perpendicular to the line of scrimmage, you can't redirect and bounce back outside if the kid stick and bounces to the perimeter, right? So we spend almost all of our time, John and Brian, almost all of our time on how to versus what to. How do I take on blocks versus what do I do, what gap do I have? Like, if you're the Mike Backer and you're always scraped to spill, I mean, how hard is it? We practice scrape. I mean, it's boring as all get out. They hate the individual. But whatever, I don't care. Don't be bored by the mundane. That's what gets you beat, right? Okay, so that's the lever player. So in this particular case, if the ball goes like this, the ball goes like this. He'll set the edge, if you will, and he'll lever. But again, he's not contained. He's not trying to turn the ball back inside. And so it takes a lot of reps, as you can imagine, for number three here to get the feel for how quickly I get to the line of scrimmage, how wide, how tight, right? Is somebody trying to, what we call, dig me out? Sometimes the slot receiver is trying to dig him out, right? we got to work on that. There's a lot of things you have to drill as far as the simple act of taking on a block, okay? All right, so with that being said, he's one. And when you ask, well, how come he's one, coach? Well, whichever way the ball goes, we start counting from one to five, right? And then you're going to see why. So one levers it. Number two, this is so simple. 
going to blow your mind. He is going to run to the hip of the lever player. That's it. I don't care what the blockers are doing. If number one, right, if number one runs outside zone and they toss it and he goes to block this guy right here, I don't care what – I don't care if number seven goes like this and the quarterback follows him. He should be screaming to the near hip of that kickout block. You can't believe how fast these guys will hit it. As long as his tight end, who he's reading, right, doesn't go vertical, he sees a down block, he should be screaming to that guy's near hip. So when number one, who we are inviting to kick out the outside backer, all of a sudden you go white jersey, blue jersey, white jersey, and you would go on and on, right? It's got to go white, blue, white, blue. You got to gap it out, right? Okay, so he's the second guy in the fit. I already talked about the third guy. What is his attack angle? What is his? What do we call his roadmap? Scrape to spill. As easy as it gets. Okay, he's three. The fourth guy, you guys know this term, it's called cutback. What does that mean? If you're the cutback player, you always stay behind the? Running back. Yep, always stay behind the ball. Way more fun. You guys are entertaining. entertaining my <laughs> well, Coach, I got a question. So, so right, you talk about roadmap, right? So your roadmap is out there. So is instantly people like, well, when we're going to put three to the field, or if we're going to go heavy, we know they're going to try to crunch it and, and crush it and, and push it out. Is, is running to the boundary something that people put on their chart and say, well, you know what? They're really going to try to stretch the field first, but we can get underneath them in the boundaries. Is that, is that an answer for this? I mean, is that what people try to come at you with? Well, I'll tell you this right now, and we're really fortunate. We have really good players. Let's not kid ourselves. I'm not a genius. But we know in this front, because we do run it, and this is where people would probably disagree with me, I know what plays we're going to get. We're going to get pin and pull to the boundary, just to your yep. point. So you know what I'm talking about, right? They're going to down right. block, and they're going to wrap around and try to get the edge on you, right? You but again, we don't play this all the time. Then we go to our different coverage. Like So we have a coverage where we play quarter, quarter, half. They cover two in the boundary. And then sometimes we put the corner outside number one, and sometimes we, we call that cloud, right? Corner, see, I love words. I'm like a word guy. Cloud, <laughs> corner lines up outside, right? That's cloud. And then we call cut. We check cut at the last minute, the corner. Let me show you this. At the last minute, the corner, he dives inside, and he corner comes under. Corner comes under. And then if he goes under, it's still cover two because it's a C word, right? Cloud and cut is both cover two to the boundary. So he's if it's cut, he's running to the window, taking away the window ball. If it's cloud, he's playing more traditional ride the rail cover two cloud, right? And so either way, there, he's the flat player. He's the lever player. He's automatically a spill guy. But we don't say the word spill because if we ran cut to the boundary, who's number one to the boundary? Corner. He's the lever player. What's yep. the linebacker then? He's the two-fitter. So what does he do? If he sees action in the boundary, he runs to the near hip of the corner, right? Who's three? It Probably the mic. He's the backside scrape to spill. So that's my point. We can just tweak one guy, and the other ten guys have the same roadmap. It's just word association. Hey, you're cut technique, but I want you to be the lever player. Oh, I know lever, coach. And then this is going to be crazy. You probably won't believe this. We have what's called a leverage circuit. We literally rotate every single guy on our defense through a three-man circuit. It's called leverage circuit. One is a kickout block. Everybody on our defense, think about this. Every single person on our defense has to be able to take on a kickout block properly, right? Every single person has to be able to scrape to spill. Because don't kid yourself. When that defensive lineman's pursuing inside out, he's scraping to spill. When you run stunts and the D tackle's looping outside, he's a, he's a scrape to spill guy. A lot of times we'll do the old cross stunt with the DTs. Guess what happens when the cross stunt comes from here and this D tackle has to work over the top? He's an automatic scrape to spill guy, leading with his inside foot, keeping his chest square. It's awesome. Now, it works for us. I'm not saying it's awesome, like, oh, I should sell it and bottle it and I'm a genius. <laughs> but I'm saying for our kids, maybe because I'm a simpleton, they can understand it, but it's, it's always about the roadmap. They know exactly where to go. And when you turn on the film and you see a freshman tight end down blocks, Boom, he knows I'm, I'm the two-fitter. I got action my way. I got a tight end down block. He's not going vertical. I can be the two-fitter. And he just sits there and waits. But so many times, we waste movement. The guy gets there early, and he just stands there, and he, he moves for the sake of moving. Hey, just chill out, man. Sit there. It's okay. It's okay if they get one yard. It doesn't have to always be a three-yard TFL. So will you get then will you get people who, who put a three- or four-man surface to the boundary and think that you're going to swing the nickel over or how do you, you know, so if you're into the boundary, then will you, if you move the nickel to the boundary, right, to be your lever player, 
do people try to get an advantage of you to the field then thinking, well, now we have more room. So if he does spill us or when they spill us, we have a chance to bounce it. We have more room to get a corner. Well, let me ask you this. When you mean to the boundary, would you say like this formation with the tight end? Yeah. Yep. Okay. So here's the beauty of it. The way that we line it up, and I didn't probably say this clearly in the beginning, but our nickel is the strong side outside backer and the wheels the yep. weak side. And so let's go back to our terminology again. Once again, the C word. What's the C word mean? We're playing cover two. The corner is the lever player. He's essentially an outside linebacker. That's why it's so important for the corner to be in leverage circuit to learn how to play the same technique as if they ran power to the field at the nickel, he'd have to lever it. They all have to lever. Corners have to lever. Sometimes the safety goes down. Because, like, let's say on this particular one right here. See this one right here? This is a pretty traditional, right? The yeah. nickel and the wheel both lever, right? Well, if we said, hey, let's switch the fit, which we do many times, the boundary safety lines up wider. All switching means is that on our vertical plane, right, up and down, you can't be on top of each other. So traditional is this, will, then backside safety. If they turn around and just say for fun, hey, man, let's switch it. Just let's screw with the quarterback. Let's switch it. Okay. At the last second, the will slides in, the boundary safety goes out. Well, who's the widest guy now? It's the boundary. So now he's the lever player. That's why he has to rep lever and lever circuit. You know what I'm saying? So we hope that, again, this is my philosophy. We're going to be simple and a couple of little – the fact that those two guys might switch the fit and the boundary has nothing to do with the other nine guys on defense. It's a little wrinkle that, to your point, you're right, John, if they wanted to run it in the boundary, they might think they got leverage on us or a better matchup or whatever. Like some people, they cringe when they see this, John. They cringe. They go, that's bad coaching when they see this. Why would you put your corner up on the line of scrimmage? Tyshawn and Brooks from the cities, Twin Cities, he's been a great player for us. He's 5'11", 160, soaking wet. But he knows how to take on a kickout block. In the leverage circuit, we teach the old Muhammad Ali sting technique, right? If that guy, let's say they bring a big old guard to kick out our little corner, he's going to run in there and give him his shoulder and kind of sting him right in the chest and stun him. And then we teach him how to shuffle his feet back outside so it's sting and pop, sting and jab, instead of just rolling up there and trying to kill him and getting collapsed. Because when we run up there and this guy, if this guy pulls and tries to kick out our little corner or even the fullback, we're going to go initiate the contact and then because he understands where he needs to be on the lever technique, he's going to go attack, maybe a yard up the field, and then feather back to the line of scrimmage and kind of – because what's that fullback going to do? He's going to load up. You're going to chuck him a little bit, and then he's going to kind of stumble because you're going to give ground. It's like the old jab, right, punch and jab. We're not dumb. I'm not going to let him kill my guy, and we're not going to cut him. But So that's my point, that we spend so much time on, hey, if a corner gets this versus now, if my will is getting kicked out by a guard, he better go stone him, right? I mean, he better take him on like a grown man and, and, you know, lever him back inside. But here's the thing. Most of your kids, when you say, hey, go set the edge, they throw all their weight into him. They try to just wreck the guy. And, and inevitably, they end up bringing their outside arm and shoulder inside. They get their body turned like this to the quarterback. And now their shoulders are almost perpendicular line of scrimmage and the tailback stick and bounces. And the guy's all twisted up like a pretzel. He can't get back outside as a lever player. The guy turns the corner and he's gone. It's a foot race. Make sense? Absolutely. So here's another example. So here's slot open now, right? Pretty typical now. So this is what I was talking about with our safety, right? He's got two speed out there, so he can't be in the run fit. So they got five, seven guys in the offensive count. You don't count the quarterback, right? So who are our – we got to have one more. So who's our eight? Well, it's always these four. And now this safety can't be in the fit, so everybody knows those four guys are in the fit. Here's doubles, two by two, right? So the safety of the field can't be in the fit. He's playing quarters. And everybody we play knows that. You know, they know that we're playing quarters, and that's fine. But they don't know how we're going to play the boundary. Now, obviously, we don't play this every single snap, but we play it the majority of the time, right? This is our base. Here's a two-by-two. Two. So do the count here, right? They've got five offensive linemen and one running back. So their count is six. So who are our seven? Well, the four is spoken for, the D-line, and you got three backers. So now when this dude is going to run zone read and quarterback keep, guess what the mic is? He's going to fall back and be scraped to spill, and he's going to push it to the nickel. Now we have like two guys in the quarterback, and if they run zone to the front side, assuming the end gets to the B gap, he's got C gap, he's got B gap, here's your two A gap players. And again, we twist the tackles and noses quite a bit. But once again, John, it doesn't matter if they twist because they both are just exchanging gaps. So to give you some perspective and concept, the nose tackle switching gaps is no different than the safety switching alignments. The concept our kids understand is, oh, switch call. 
Everybody knows what a switch call is. Me and you, I, I, the mic and the nickel could switch it. On the snap of the ball, the nickel could get inside. As long as on the snap of the ball, the nickel's inside the mic, they can switch the fit. And when we've been really good, like last year, we were fortunate. We were pretty good last year defensively. We had veteran guys. Alex Gettle was a, a really smart player. I had a veteran backer. Two, my two linebackers, Alex Gettle and Dustin Woody, they were both seniors. They rotated every other series. And then Zach Robertson, a kid out of Mayo. Zach was probably the best defensive player we had in our team as far as an individual performer. Athletic, fast. He would start switching the fit all the time because he started figuring out, well, in this formation, if I switch it and I go inside and I push the safety outside, I can make more tackles. So then I had to talk to him because the safety got mad because he was feeling like he's taking all the tackles. And so we had that little issue. But, yeah, it is what it is. <laughs>